Hello, and welcome to Nightmare Masterclass. My name is David Stockdale. I'll be your host on this excursion into the dark unknown. In the previous installment, I analyzed Disco Elysium through the lens of literary critic Frederick Jameson. Namely, I looked at the work in terms of Jameson's political horizon, the very first stop on our ideological bus route. But that was only the start of our investigation. In this video, I'm analyzing Disco Elysium through the realm of the social, Jameson's second semantic horizon, and the historical, the third and final horizon. Before we get started, I just wanted to say if you like my videos and want to support me on a monthly basis, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash nightmare masterclass. Oh, and I just released a two-part breakdown of Jameson's Political Unconscious, which I'm thinking can serve as a companion piece to this analysis. If you'd like to know more about Political Unconscious, that would be a good place to start. Also, I just published an essay on Medium called Fascism in the Age of Coronavirus. Spicy title, I know. I'm making an effort to branch out and use platforms other than YouTube, so I'd really appreciate it if you gave that a read and uh, <sighs> clap for it, I guess. I, I don't know. First, I want to start with a little preface about the nature of this discussion. I received a few comments on my last video indicating that perhaps not everyone was following along, at least with respect to the denser theory laden portion of the video. I just wanted to say that if you felt completely lost during that part of the discussion, it's probably an issue on my part, not yours. My goal here is to make theory as accessible as possible to a general audience so as to foster critical thinking. And the last thing I want to do is make anyone feel inadequate. I think part of the challenge with this sort of thing is this pervasive tendency to assume that if you don't get something right away, it's a total failure. Let's try to move away from that kind of thinking. Now, to be sure, there are certain complexities that cannot be avoided with Jameson or, for that matter, any such thinker. The section of Jameson's book from which I derive my little primer is, well, it's dense. So it's totally understandable that one might not absorb everything upon an initial explanation. It's actually kind of a given that you're not going to. I certainly didn't. And I'm sure there are aspects to it that I'm still not fully getting. There are also different ways of learning things, which is why I make videos. Videos at least provide the opportunity to include visual aids, which some people find helpful. But in my own studies, I find it helps to use a text-to-speech app and read as I listen to a given text out loud. That's just what works for me. Figure out what works best for you and try not to beat yourself up if you're having trouble. If you do have specific questions, feel free to leave a comment or go ahead and email me at nightmaremasterclass at gmail.com. I may not have the precise answer to your question, but I'll at least try to point you in the right direction. So if this kind of theory is so complex and difficult, why bother with it at all? I can only speak for myself. I think Jameson's approach to textual interpretation is important because it's a kind of analysis that centralizes the struggle inherent within all class societies, and it seeks to connect those struggles by detecting certain traces within the text. It doesn't seek to look at works in a vacuum, and its goal is not simply a dry intellectual exercise reserved only for university settings. We're not concerned here with abstract ideas such as the human condition and the potential for so-called great works to illuminate it. Rather, we're concerned with the general development of humanity itself and the manner in which art is connected to the struggles of everyday people. So without further ado, let's flesh out some of the finer points I brought up towards the end of my last video. Recall that in the first horizon of interpretation, the political, the work's resolution is understood explicitly as a symbolic act seeking to resolve real contradictions. What that means in the case of Disco Elysium is certainly up for debate. In my first video, I established the view that our culprit, the so-called deserter, has engaged in something of a paradoxical act, symbolically speaking. I'm referring, of course, to the assassination of the lead mercenary, our victim. This act is paradoxical 
because it can be understood simultaneously as the awakening of the revolutionary ethos in the aptly named Revachal, but also as a regressive impulse whose motivations are rooted in reaction and more specifically, solipsism. I'll come back to this in my discussion of the work as it can be understood in Jameson's Social Horizon, so stay tuned. The second horizon of Jameson's interpretive model is that of the social order. At this level of understanding, we can conceive of the individual text as an utterance or parole in a much broader discourse. Therefore, we must situate Disco Elysium into the larger discourse it inhabits, specifically in terms of the discourse of class society. In one sense, this will not be difficult, since the work very clearly has a healthy amount of class oriented subtext. Yet, in another sense, I do think the class elements of Disco Elysium are deceptively conspicuous as far as how they fit into the broader themes of the work. Much like the story's central arc, the supposed lynching that you are sent to investigate, the events of Disco Elysium are staged in a certain way. So, what's going on here? For starters, perhaps the work exhibits a certain understanding of the way classes relate to one another. For simplicity's sake, I think it's best to understand the Debardeurs Union as the predominant representation of the working class within the game. Likewise, Wild Pines is the predominant representation of the capitalist class. In the previous video, I discussed capitalist realism, the pervasive sense that there is no alternative to capitalism. Capitalist realism plays a very important role in this analysis. Specifically, it functions as the mediatory bridge from Jameson's narrowly political horizon to his social horizon. Recall that we are extending the scope of our analysis from the political level in which the text is understood as a symbolic resolution of a certain contradiction. In the case of Disco Elysium, capitalist realism serves as an ideal bridge because it's a distinct phenomenon both in the fictional world of Disco Elysium and in our own shared reality. Or at least that's what I would argue. Specifically, the manner in which free market ideology is depicted within the game serves to call attention to a much broader class discourse going on in the world right now. Especially now, when certain economic contradictions are apparently coming to a head. I do think it's fair to say people who have not critically engaged with the way our economy works before are now beginning to question certain underlying assumptions. With this in mind, let's come to an understanding regarding the way capitalist realism functions within the work. The game's repeated evocations of capitalist realism appear at first glance to be nothing more than a series of sardonic gestures and pithy jokes, but I think there's more going on than just that. In capitalist realism, Mark Fisher offers a certain understanding of capitalism as a dark potentiality throughout history that has only just in the past few hundred years really made itself known. Fisher says, when it actually arrives, capitalism brings with it a massive desacralization of culture. It is a system which is no longer governed by any transcendent law. On the contrary, it dismantles all such codes only to reinstall them on an ad hoc basis. And boy, does that line remind me a lot of the various dialogue options you are given in Disco Elysium. Oftentimes you have the option to exercise your authority now there's a code that certainly seems to be applied on an ad hoc basis in this game. But so too do you have the ability to exercise empathy, but mostly when it suits your goals. Thus, a committed Marxist, me, went into this game with the full intention of starting some kind of communist revolution. And do you know what I ended up doing? I convinced those poor women in the village to sign off on some forms which, in all likelihood, will end up driving them out of their homes in a process of ruthless gentrification. I'm ashamed of myself. But you know, it is a game. There are parameters to this game, just like there are parameters to being an individual in a capitalist system, or any system for that matter. There are ways in which the story is confined 
and contained. This is unavoidable with this type of game, just purely from a production standpoint. You can't have a game with endless story options. That's a game that never finishes the development phase. And so the key to this is to make it not obvious that the story is confined, to endow the world with a sense of endless possibilities. Disco Elysium passes that test with flying colors. There's an unmistakable openness to this game that makes other computer role-playing games seem like Tetris. And yet, it is only in detecting the fissures within this prevailing sense of openness and laying bare the containment strategies that keep it melded together that we will come to some understanding of what this work means in the broader discourse. One clear polar coordinate that we must stake out in our analysis is pro-capitalist ideology. Some version of a pro-capitalist line is an option in nearly every scene, but the game makes it fairly clear that the reification of the market is a social phenomenon, a product of pure ideology. It is not natural, and efforts to convey it as such are naive at best and cynical rationalizations at worst. To demonstrate this, let's talk about the elusive mega-rich light-bending guy. This entity resides in one of the large industrial containers in the dockyards. Upon an initial inspection, one might consider the protagonist's passing exchanges with this character to be ancillary, a funny sort of easter egg. but. Contained within these exchanges is a telling detail about the manner in which commodity exchange generally mediates the social life of Elysium's inhabitants. The mega-rich light-bending guy is, quote, an extremely high net worth individual, end quote. Perhaps he considers billionaire to be a slur. When challenged, the mega-rich light-bending guy says, Listen, Harry, I used to be an idealist just like you, but the truth is that we have no objective system by which to measure someone's value other than the market. We should just embrace that rather than resist it. The hand that allocates resources among men is invisible and cruel, but it is steady, measured, and indeed it is just. In particular, the mega-rich light-bending guy is channeling Margaret Thatcher. Recall that Thatcher proclaimed, there is no alternative to the market system. Your encyclopedia states, enough time had passed from the failure of revolution that, for a fleeting moment, free market economy seemed like the ultimate uncontested way of life for our species. Here we have the defining element of capitalist realism. Again, the pervasive sense that capitalism is the only game in town. To top it off, we are told that once high net worth individuals reach a certain level of wealth, their very presence actually warps the laws of physics. According to the detective's encyclopedia, the wise Weissman coefficient is a ratio designed to reflect the difference in net worth between individuals. When the coefficient is close to 1 or 100%, it means that one person possesses all of the net worth among that group of individuals. It's been observed that when the weiss weissman coefficient reaches about 0.96 or so, the laws of physics begin to bend around the high net worth individual. Perhaps we can think of Steve Jobs and the so-called reality distortion field he created. This description is clearly satirical. What is it satirizing? Note the manner in which personal wealth is depicted explicitly in terms of scientific fact. In all class societies, the ideology of the ruling class is, in part, a sort of purposeful conflation of historically contingent social relations the way people relate to one another, with that of reality itself, oftentimes simply understood as the natural order of things. This is then projected onto the subordinate classes so as to make them internalize their own subordinate status. In other words, the goal of the ruling class, whether conscious or otherwise, is to make the lower classes believe that members of the ruling class are in that position because they belong there in some way. 
and that this hierarchy is completely natural. And so any efforts to change the natural order of things are, of course, inherently unnatural and therefore doomed from the very start. In the capitalist framework, those with wealth are oftentimes said to deserve the money they have because they earned it. Whether this is legitimated through vague deference to concepts such as meritocracy or perhaps just the good old-fashioned Protestant work ethic, the idea is that wealthy people are exactly where they're supposed to be, and in turn, you lowly workers are exactly where you're supposed to be. Aesthetic displays of wealth can have an effect on the detective's psyche as well. At one point, the detective happens upon a fancy pair of shoes, black monk straps. Items of clothing tend to give you bonuses of some kind, but the monk straps have a rather strange bonus. Plus one to indirect modes of taxation, affluent moneymaker man, save our fair, chimes in. Remember, when they come to take it away from you, you worked for those shoes. Whether you like it or not, wearing these shoes has made you more liberal, ultra liberal. It's worth mentioning that ultra-liberalism is the game's in-universe ideology held by the mega-rich. It's something akin to right-wing libertarianism with its advocation of the so-called free market. With respect to these spiffy shoes, rhetoric ads, they're either a gateway drug or a booster pack to get you deeper into free market ideology. As it turns out, savor fair is a liberalizing drive. It gets you to think about so-called indirect modes of taxation that drain your finances. If you refuse to buy into the free market ideology pushed by Savior Fair, it actually accuses you of being racist. This is perhaps what you might call the personification of quote-unquote woke liberalism. Capitalist realism is a pervasive ideology that cannot allow for conceptions of thought that defy market forces. And so any effort to do so must be condemned in the strongest possible terms, in this case, by simply characterizing it as racist. We can, of course, call to mind real-world scenarios in which this form of capitalist realism has made itself known. For instance, during the recent UK election, centrist liberals and conservatives alike clearly exhibited bad faith efforts to characterize Jeremy Corbyn as anti-Semitic, or at least tolerant of anti-Semitism within his party. The work emphasizes this form of capitalist realism at another point in the game as well, during which the detective also happens upon a mug with some racist caricatures. One of the options when analyzing the mug is as follows. By denouncing it, I can earn political capital to mask my badass hustling, i.e. fraud and embezzlement. Clearly, this is a commentary on the manner in which radical movements have all too often been co-opted by corporations, not only in order to capitalize on certain trends, but also to render any such movement that defies the rule of capital completely impotent. How many ads are we now seeing that are basically shameless attempts to co-opt the Black Lives Matter movement? Just an example. How does capitalist realism affect the art scene? Art in the world of Disco Elysium seems to be in a state of utter stagnation. Towards the beginning of the story, the best Cindy the Skull can muster is a hastily painted red streak across the tenement in which she resides. This place is severely lacking in havoc, Cindy says. Not even the occasional trash can fire to break up the tedium. Art, in this sense, is not so much a means of expression or a way to subvert the dominant modes of culture. Rather, it's simply a way to break up the monotony. It reminds me in some ways of the 1970s counterculture, if indeed it can even be called that, as it was characterized in Adam Curtis's hyper-normalization. In the face of bankers essentially having carried out an informal coup on the city of New York, Many artists sever themselves from politics out of a sense of total powerlessness. Curtis writes, they didn't try and change it, they just experienced it. But some of the left saw something else was really going on, that by detaching themselves and retreating into an ironic coolness, a whole generation were beginning to lose touch with the reality of power. One of them wrote of that time, it was the mood of the era and the revolution was deferred indefinitely. And while we were dozing, the money crept in. 
So too does Cindy's artistic paralysis call to mind Fisher's concept of the slow cancellation of the future, the idea that we're all stuck in an endless cycle of retro nostalgia. We can call to mind the success of Stranger Things, for instance. Culture in Martinez can't begin to form an aesthetic that is authentically new, as it were. It's a vortex of hopelessness in which only immediate needs can be gratified. This, I would argue, is a subtle effect of the market's continual reification in everyday life. Importantly, once the mercenaries are defeated, Cindy is suddenly able to find words to commit to her canvas, the streets of Martinez. Un jour, je sali de retour près de toi. One day, I will return to your side. The message is written in blood and fuel oil. Importantly, the blood is a product of the shootout between the RCM and the mercenaries. This represents a marked shift in Cindy's creative life. But it's not just that. The realization of Cindy's artistic vision is a sign of a certain renewal in Martinez. Partially, it's a hope for a future not so devoid of meaning. And importantly, it's a work of street art. You have the option to set the words on fire. I would humbly suggest that you do it, because Cindy's work is not something that should be commodified. Simply put, this is revolutionary art. It's a meditation on the possibility of a working class united in solidarity, an activated, class-conscious proletariat. I mentioned before that Yosef's Murderous Act is, to some degree, evocative of a concept known as solipsism. Solipsism has many philosophical implications going back to the ancient Greeks. Here, it can essentially be understood as the pervasive notion that nothing else exists other than one's own consciousness. Practically, no one believes this in literal terms, unless you're some kind of crank philosopher, in which case, don't contact me. But, you know, there are compensatory ways in which solipsism is subtly evoked and promoted in everyday life. Much of the discontent of contemporary life is rooted in solipsistic practices. Social media is deeply fucking solipsistic because as much as you want to think it's about connecting with other people, it's really about that dopamine fix when you get some stranger to like your tweet. I would argue that Twitter is, in many ways, a platform founded upon solipsistic grounds. It aims to validate the self and nothing but the self. It incentivizes narcissism and obsession with self-image. Now, the deserter's solipsism is immediately discernible considering he's been alone on an island practically for decades. Yosef is clearly not out of his mind, nor is he part of a philosophical niche that legitimately espouses solipsism. Rather, Yosef's worldview is unconsciously motivated by an unrelenting sense of isolation and, more importantly, atomization. And hence, you have a devout communist who is simultaneously some kind of reactionary incel. I'd guess this is more common than you might think in real life. Further recall that Yosef believes the bourgeoisie are not human. Mm, look, I get it, but that's an extremely bad way to think about one's political opponent. While the capitalist class is the ideological enemy of the communist, I think most would agree there is no place for this type of dehumanization on the left. The reason for this isn't as simple as it's wrong to dehumanize people. I mean, I happen to believe that as well, but my individual morals are really besides the point. Any sensible Marxist analysis hinges upon a specific understanding of historical development in which contemporary society, and prior societies for that matter, are composed of certain groups which have irreconcilable material interests. These groups are known as classes. This framework does not scapegoat any particular group as inherently evil. Rather, it seeks to understand how these societies function by analyzing the manner in which the classes that compose it relate to one another. There's nothing uniquely evil about the capitalist class in terms of their particular traits as people. They are not intrinsically evil. And so when Yosef dehumanizes them, it indicates that he has fallen into reactionary territory. He has unwittingly allowed the capitalist class of Elysium to colonize his very mind. 
He's arguing on the terrain of the enemy, and worse yet, he doesn't even know it. This is the tragic nature of the deserter. If this were a real world incident, we might well chalk it up to the very obvious observation that revolutionaries aren't perfect. They are in fact capable of lapsing into reactionary ideology. In fact, history is riddled with instances of this. However, since we're talking about a work of art, it makes sense to try and unpack the symbolic significance of the resolution. At the level of the text, Yosef's motivations are explicitly understood as a mixture of jealousy and resentment. At a very basic emotional level, Yosef is jealous of the mercenary for engaging in a sexual relationship with Klashe, the object of his affection. It's important to note that, of course, Yosef doesn't even know Klashe. He's been spying on her from afar. Jealousy and resentment go hand in hand, but there is a political valiance to this resentment as well. Namely, our isolated revolutionary harbors feelings of anger and hatred towards the capitalist class, and understandably so. The mercenary's very presence in Martinez is an affront to his entire being. These private security contractors are nothing more than thugs who operate at the behest of the capitalist coalition. In a sense, Yosef's actions can be understood as a form of misdirected anger. Ever since Clashé's arrival, Yosef has been projecting his own idea of who she is onto her, a person he doesn't even know, a person with her own thoughts, feelings, and opinions on things. Psychologically speaking, Yosef's real frustration is misidentifying Clashé as someone he might conceivably know, both in the general sense and the biblical sense. In other words, his real problem lies in the fact that he's cut himself off from society. And yet, there's simply no getting around the fact that his actions have led directly to the death of a class enemy. Indeed, one actively engaged in sabotaging the working class of Martinez. The deserter has lapsed into reactionary thinking, and yet he has committed a revolutionary act. This is what I mean when I say the resolution is paradoxical. I want to briefly discuss a key philosophical concept known as a homology. Don't be intimidated by this technical sounding word. A homology is really just the idea that there exists a certain kind of sameness at a structural level between certain distinct conceptual schemas. In other words, one might posit that the principles by which a certain framework operates also apply to a seemingly disparate framework. Jameson also uses the term isomorphism and structural parallelism. But again, we're really just talking about a certain kind of sameness at the structural level. For instance, French philosopher Lucien Goldman argued that there's a homology between the literary form of the novel and the economic form of the commodity. Don't know about that one, chief. Another, perhaps equally contentious example, Lacan famously claimed that the unconscious is structured like a language, referring to a certain understanding of language evinced by structural linguists like Saussure. So why am I talking about homologies? Well, in the interaction of semiotic constraints, a notable semiotician named A.J. Grimus used the concept of homologies as a starting point for his linguistic model. The model put forth by Grimus consists of crisscrossing binary oppositions in the form of something called a semiotic square. The square is a conceptualization of Grimus's understanding of the semantic universe. It's a kind of tool to engage in the meta-analysis of concepts. A YouTube channel called The Nature of Writing has a great breakdown of the Grimus square, so check it out if you want to know more. In The Political Unconscious, Jameson speculates that perhaps Grimus was attempting to map out the logical structure of reality itself. If this is the case, it would seem that a term coined by Umberto Eco is apt here, ontological structuralism, whereby categories of reality are true regardless of history. But Jameson thinks the use of homologies in certain understandings of, say, materialism have led to the practice of cutting corners. Perhaps you might say it has produced lazy thinking in the field. 
But despite Grimus's reliance on homologies as the basis for his framework, Jameson thinks the Grimus square can be reappropriated by understanding it not as a static analytical tool used to parse the relationship between signs, but rather by, quote, designating it as the very locus and model of ideological closure. So where Grimus sees a model for unpacking the deeper structure of signs via logical closure, Jameson sees a model for uncovering the ideology of a text. Think of ideological closure as the intellectual limits necessitated by a given ideology. What is not allowed for as a possibility in a given ideological framework? For instance, why has the response to police brutality in the past so often been to pin it on a few bad apples? Well, liberalism hinges upon a certain understanding of the individual in relation to larger institutions. The individual holds a special ideological place in liberalism, and so it only makes sense that liberals are wont to blame individual cops as opposed to the larger structures that enable and incentivize police to enact this kind of violence. One might even say it's the very function of police in a capitalist system. Ideological closure is the thing that disallows or at least discourages the very possibility of a certain line of thought from entering into the mind of a given subject. When the Grimus Square is applied in the sense that Jameson espouses, it, quote, maps the limits of a specific ideological consciousness and marks the conceptual points beyond which that consciousness cannot go and between which it is condemned to oscillate. Of course, Jameson is careful to note that this application of the Grimus Square is not meant to spell out all logical objective possibilities within an ideological formulation, but rather to map the quote-unquote inner limits of such a formulation. He adds, quote, the very closure of the semiotic rectangle now affords a way into the text, not by positing mere logical possibilities and permutations, but rather through its diagnostic revelation of terms or nodal points implicit within the ideological system, which have, however, remained unrealized in the surface of the text, which have failed to become manifest in the logic of the narrative, and which we can therefore read as what the text represses. So, through a process of, quote, radically historicizing reappropriation, logical closure becomes a tool for identifying that which a historical text seeks to repress. Here, I have mapped out various elements of dialogue and explication within the game in terms of the Grimus Square. It's worth noting that we could well make a square for Harry himself, although Harry's particular values are contingent upon your choices as the player. Anyway, we can understand this square to be the ideological model within the world of Disco Elysium, where the double lines represent relations of implication, or you might say complementary or compatible relations, and the stagger lines represent relations of a contrary nature, notions that oppose one another in semantic terms within the framework established or at least suggested in the text. And finally, the solid arrows represent relations of a contradictory nature, characters and organizations within the game that not only oppose one another, but exist in a sort of antagonistic relationship, such that their relationship can be understood in an overarching schematic sense. Of course, we are attempting to unpack the implications of the work in terms of its allegorical significance, so we're going to need to map the real-world analogs here as well. Disco Elysium really lends itself to this type of analysis, so this is a fairly straightforward exercise. Moralism is a pretty clear analog for liberalism, and the ideology known as ultra-liberalism within the work is something akin to right-wing libertarianism. As stated, Kras Mazov is very clearly a reference to Karl Marx, and so too is his notion of scientific communism a clear reference to Engels' notion of scientific socialism. 
This is all very surface level, but Jameson thinks the Grimus Square is useful for finding what the text seeks to mystify or repress. In this case, that's a tricky question. One rather obvious thing to note is that the climax of the story has Harry and Kim get between the mercenaries and the Hardy Boys, the militant wing of the Debardeurs Union. And while outcomes may vary, the intention of the RCM as a force that might conceivably intervene in such matters is, well, curious. In fact, Kim, ever dutiful to the RCM, does not allow for very much hesitation before intervening. And if I had one major criticism of this work to offer, I would suggest that if the role of the RCM is meant to be anything akin to our police, the way in which this climax functions within the story perhaps could serve to mystify the degree to which police are really on the side of capital. Perhaps this understanding of police as the repressive state apparatus is itself something that the text seeks to repress. Note that I'm not attempting to understand the specific intentions of the people who developed this game. Rather, I'm trying to map the ideological preconditions entailed by the very concept of a game in which something like a detective serves as the protagonist. This is rooted primarily in the market logic of game development in late capitalism. After all, in order for something like this to be successful, the player really must be able to identify with the protagonist. And it's kind of difficult to identify with someone who's been tasked with stomping their boot on the face of the working class until the end of time. But let's say you're really into noir fiction as a genre. Well, if you're really dead set on your protagonist being a detective because of its noir-esque connotations and you want to be self-aware about it, well, in that case, you need to contrive a scenario in which the detective is compelled in some way to quote-unquote do the right thing despite certain obvious failings, some of which are individual and some of which are surely structural. For starters, working for an institution with a somewhat ambiguous structural origin, such as the Revachal Citizens Militia, does give you a bit of plausible deniability. Kim says it's a point of contention whether the citizens of Revachal or the coalition government founded the RCM. The only other thing you really need is an antagonist who is significantly worse than an alcoholic cop. In this case, it's a fucking death squad, so yeah, mission accomplished. Now, here's a spicy question. Does this rise to the level of copaganda? That is to say, is this game doing the work of public relations for police as an institution? I'm inclined to say no, not really, since there are so many elements of the work that call attention to the structural role of the RCM as something that's fundamentally negative for society. Like I pointed out in my first video, oftentimes doing a praiseworthy thing in the game requires operating outside the scope of your job as an RCM officer. But maybe I'm biased because full disclosure, I really like this game. Another somewhat uncharitable interpretation is that the game is attempting to mystify the degree to which certain acts or behaviors we might deem unethical or antisocial are necessary in order to achieve good outcomes. I have to say, that wasn't my initial impression, although I can see how one might arrive at that conclusion considering, you know, Claire tolerates racists within his ranks and is actively engaged in deceptive behavior in order to gentrify the village. But also, Claire is explicitly depicted in a way that makes him not entirely sympathetic. Simply put, he's a corrupt union boss, so he's not exactly the ideal model of righteousness within the work. Yet, there are moments when your empathy clocks him as entirely sincere in his desire to improve the standards of living for the people of Revachal. The reading I would encourage here hinges upon Claire as a model for precisely what not to do, at least when it comes to these fissure points such as his tolerance for racism and his willingness to throw the most vulnerable people in society under the bus for some vague cause known as progress. 
what if Claire is so mired in this bullshit that he's internalized the idea that there's no alternative to endlessly compromising on his ethics, that there's no alternative on settling for certain so-called necessary evils? Perhaps this is capitalist realism in one of its more elusive manifestations. Yet another uncharitable interpretation of the work is that everything, every perceptual horizon possible, is simply ideology at its core. It's ideology all the way down to the very root of the matter. There's no way out. Oftentimes, among the various dialogue options provided, there is no choice that does not in some way inculcate a sense of capitalist realism. Even the negation of capitalist realism reifies its primacy in some way. But what if all these positions, these various dialogue options provided, are themselves symptoms of capitalist realism? I want to broaden the discourse away from any individual choices you might make within the game or on the part of any particular character, because I think this game is really about the immense difficulty of living in a flawed world and identifying a viable way forward, a path you can live with, one that doesn't entail complete and total self-hatred at the end of the day. The third horizon of interpretive possibility is the historical, human history as a whole. Jameson calls history the final horizon because it is the absolute limit of our understanding. It is, in Jameson's words, untranscendable. This is the final and ultimate horizon of interpretation, that of the broad scope of history, its organizing unity being the Marxian notion of the mode of production. In this third horizon, the textual object is systematically reconstructed in terms of what Jameson refers to as the ideology of form, that is, quote, the determinate contradiction of specific messages emitted by varied sign systems which coexist in a given artistic process, as well as in its general social formation. An analysis that hinges upon modes of production necessarily entails the historical transition of various stages from primitive communism to the hierarchical kinship societies of the Neolithic era. Then there is the Asiatic mode of production, the master-slave system of Rome, and then you have feudalism, capitalism, and communism. Each of these modes of production necessitates a specific prevailing ideology, which colors the understanding of all things. Feudalism had the divine rights of kings, and well, I guess we have a great number of various ideological elements of capitalism that support its propagation, foremost of which at this point, I would say, is capitalist realism, as it has been outlined in this video. A theorist named Nikos Polensis articulated a distinction between the concept of a mode of production as a theoretical construction and a quote-unquote social formation. Jameson thinks there's a screwed up sort of empiricist bent to this, but the important thing to retain in this line of thought is the idea that multiple modes of production exist simultaneously at any given time. For instance, capitalism retains vestiges of feudalism, and so too does it contain anticipatory tendencies towards some new mode. We can perhaps understand Jameson's third horizon as something couched in the perpetual struggle of various modes of production to achieve dominance, such that a given mode eventually becomes generalized. We can conceive of various sometimes contradictory codes within the text in terms of some given mode of production, some of which are surely quote-unquote objectified survivals from older modes, and contrarily, some can be thought of as anticipatory. Through this lens, we can reveal the false problem of, for instance, whether it's class or gender that has some primacy in the final analysis. I'm referring, of course, to the classic and still ongoing debate between Marxism and feminism, in particular, liberal feminism. Jameson thinks that this tendency to frame class against other divisions such as gender is wrongheaded since patriarchy is simply an archaic mode of production 
based on the division of labor between men and women. And so elements of sexism that exist at the systemic level in contemporary society are perhaps traces of this division that have persisted into present day society, thereby subsumed into the present system. I would go on to say that this feminist struggle is deeply connected to the struggle entailed by the ruthless exploitation of workers in capitalism. We can even conceive of these struggles as part of a larger struggle occurring all throughout history, the ongoing fight to achieve emancipation for all people, which necessarily entails the fight to, in Jameson's words, wrest a realm of freedom from the realm of necessity. This is where ideas such as socialist feminism, decolonization, and intersectionality come into play. But don't take it from me, take it from Angela Davis when she says the roots of sexism and homophobia are found in the same economic and political institutions that serve as the foundation of racism in this country and more often than not, the same extremist circles that inflict violence on people of color are responsible for the eruptions of violence inspired by sexist and homophobic biases. Our political activism must clearly manifest our understanding of these connections. So how does this connect to the damn game? Well, history is a phantom in Disco Elysium. I mean, you play a cop who doesn't remember who he is. This brings to mind the so-called Son of Lung, an urban legend in the game about a cop who's so far undercover that he can't remember who he is. As it turns out, there are deeply significant compensatory reasons as to why Detective Harry Dubois doesn't seem to remember who he is. I would argue that deep down, a major part of him doesn't want to remember. And so it goes with the history of Revachal itself. It's the site of a failed revolution. Martinez is, as Kim says, the puddle at the end of some drain pipe. Revachal is the place where history stalled. It's like one of those countries where the music is all from like five years ago. The former capital is divided into east and west sections. In the 30s, Revachal East transformed into the world's largest tax haven. Though the world economy appeared stable at the time, Messier states it was a market mirage fueled by cocaine and quantitative easing. It was followed by the 40s, a period of economic decline. Now, here's the really, uh, I guess you would say, poignant aspect of this fictional history. According to Messier, a pandemic is what kicked off the failed communist revolution. Let that sink in. Messier states that a nation called Grad was unable to contain a disease, after which its government was overthrown. The leader of this revolution was named Kraz Mazov. According to our nifty encyclopedia, Mazov was an economist and historical materialist as well as the father of quote-unquote scientific communism. Prior to the revolution, King Philippe III reigned supreme in Revachal. He is referred to as Philippe the Squanderer due to his reckless and hedonistic behavior. A monument of the disgraced monarch has been reconstructed in the middle of town, a sort of ironic testament to his unmitigated decadence. Opinions on the revolution differ, but one thing is for sure. The communists were on the losing end. The revolution occurred at the turn of the century. Even 50 years after the revolution, certain reactionaries still yearn for monarchical rule. This is known as anti-centennial nostalgia in the world of Disco Elysium. So how do we understand the work in terms of Jameson's historical horizon? The question, I think, is best addressed by focusing on the manner in which certain coded language is telegraphed to the player. For instance, the book peddler forces her daughter to promote the business outside in the cold. Annette says, Mom says a proper worker is dutiful. That's how you get ahead in life. You succeed. Here we have a combination of two capitalist ideologies. First, we have the Protestant work ethic, work for its own sake, a virtue in and of itself. And then we have the notion that if you work hard enough, your labor will pay off. 
This is assuredly a gesture towards meritocracy. These traces of ideology can be detected in a single comment from a character, and so too can they be detected within the broader arcs of the story. Let's take, for instance, the legitimizing narrative established in the work regarding the coalition's right to govern. A coalition official known as the Sunday Friend says inflation is a killer, like heart disease blocking the normal circulation of the economy. It must be controlled. According to the Sunday Friend, the central goal of sound monetary policy is the price stability in order to maintain high levels of economic activity. The Sunday Friend is very evasive. He says, stability is the raison d'etre of the moral inter. It's the reason why I identify as a moralist. He goes on to say that moralists believe in a quote-unquote normal, stable world governed by democratic values. Based on the information provided in these aforementioned lines of dialogue, moralism is very clearly an in-world analog for centrist-style liberalism. Messier says that the liberals were the beneficiaries of the war, the last standing when the war finally ended. And, you know, she is surprisingly forthcoming. Messier relays a fairly straightforward recounting of historical events, of course, from the perspective of a self-professed ultra-liberal. An international organization known as the Coalition ultimately seized power. Their ideology is known as moralism. According to Messier, the moralists believe in keeping everything exactly the way it is. In other words, the purpose of the Coalition is to preserve the status quo. In this world, that means maintaining quote-unquote mineral rights, a thinly veiled reference to the foundational principle of property rights in liberalism. Kim notes the RCM was formed by the coalition government to restore order in the international zone after the revolution. So we did. Now we attempt to maintain that order. No more, no less. So you can see how this is consistent with the moral intern's mandate to maintain the status quo. Kim describes the Moralist International as, quote, a union of center-left and center-right parties across the Real Belt. Our coalition government is just one of its many projects. They run most intergovernmental organizations in the world. The moralists claim to believe in the humanist project started by Her Innocence Dolores Day four centuries prior to the events of Disco Elysium. But Kim is uncomfortable discussing politics. In his words, the moral in turn are a fact. I try not to have opinions on facts until they change. This above all else is the heart of capitalist realism. It's the pragmatic conflation of historical contingencies and so-called facts. Declarations about the way nature itself works. By understanding the moral intern as a plain stated fact, Kim is able to wash his hands of politics and simply perform his job. This tendency, this nihilism masked in the austere visage of pragmatism is, above all else, what the work seeks to undermine in its own special way. As stated, the magic bullet of Disco Elysium, the assassination of the victim by the deserter, is an imaginary solution to a very real contradiction. Capitalist realism is synonymous with the ever-present notion that there is no viable alternative to capitalism. And yet, Capitalism itself is prone to crises, increasingly severe crises, it would seem. Time and time again, we see the failure of the free market to adequately provide enough resources to meet everyone's needs. At this point, thousands of people a day are dying from coronavirus, the unemployment rate is at an all-time high, and the entire country has erupted into protests due to the murder of George Floyd by a Minneapolis police officer. It seems we have crossed the Rubicon. Remember the deserter's magic bullet, the paradoxical acceleration of events leading to a possible revolution, an acceleration which is, at the same time, a regression into solipsism. Is it true that in reality no such magic bullet exists? do we simply have to suffer through a succession of gradually worsening conditions until at some point total barbarism reigns supreme? I hate to say it, but that seems like the route we're currently on. Let me attack this from another angle. 
Is there, dare I say, revolutionary potential within the Imperial Corps? I really have no idea, and I'm probably on some kind of list for just asking that. But, you know, it does seem as though certain factors are leading towards an activated proletariat, a united working class that is explicitly pissed off at the ruling class, the capitalist class. A number of mainstream economists have tried to paint a fairly optimistic picture with respect to the current state of things. They say our economy was healthy prior to the pandemic, but it wasn't. A number of factors seem to indicate that it was actually deeply unstable. Of course, wages in the US haven't been commensurate with productivity in over 40 years. The middle class has been shrinking for decades. There's been a concerted push towards freelance work without benefits. This shifts the tax burden to individuals instead of businesses. Healthcare, education, and housing costs are all at historical highs. Interest rates are as low as they can possibly be without going negative. Even mainstream economists such as Alan Greenspan have acknowledged that the widening gap between the rich and the poor is threatening the stability of liberal democracies and capitalism itself. Thus, there is an argument to be made that COVID hit us right when we are on the brink of a major economic catastrophe. It's fair to say at this point that the virus has pushed us into a full-blown recession. And I'm not a fortune teller or anything, but it does seem as though conditions are ripe for a possible housing crash on the horizon as well. In the broad scope of things, it seems a terminal crisis is in the works. And I think for the first time in my lifetime, there's a non-trivial chance that the U.S. as we know it will not exist in, say, 10 years. To be sure, there are confounding factors. For instance, the Fed has pumped unprecedented amounts of fictitious capital into the stock market. In the immediate sense, this seems to have tempered investor sell-offs for now. But we really have no idea about the long-term effects of this. And of course, the threat of fascism is more disconcerting than perhaps ever before. I would refer again to my essay, Fascism in the Age of Coronavirus on Medium. There's also a contradictory thing going on between rentier capital and productive capital. And I don't know how that's going to play out. But it really seems to me like something's got to give here. I have posited the question, is the era of capitalist realism over? An astounding 54% of the public think burning down that police precinct in Minneapolis is justified. And subsequently, the city council has committed to disbanding the police. And apparently, there was an autonomous zone in Seattle. You realize no matter how the media depicted those events, the fact that something called an autonomous zone lasted over a few days in the U.S. is mind-blowing, right? It may not have been autonomous in the technical sense, but the intentionality of an organized effort such as this should not go unnoted. At the risk of sounding a little dramatic, these events very well could be the beginning of the end for the hegemonic belief that there is no viable alternative to capitalism. I would just say, be wary of so-called pragmatists who try to be the arbiters of what's really possible right now. They might just have internalized a bit of that capitalist realism, you know? That wraps it up for this installment of Nightmare Masterclass. If you enjoy my videos and want to support me on a monthly basis, again, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash nightmare masterclass. Thank you for watching and good night.